Hello and welcome back to my channel. As you can tell from the title, today is not uh, the usual fare of my blog. Um, I think first and foremost I have to say my heart goes out to the Georgia Tech community and especially uh, all the students currently at Georgia Tech. Um, these last two weeks have been a very trying time uh, as uh, Scout Schultz was shot committing suicide by a cop um, two Saturdays ago. And uh, it's especially difficult, as I understand, for the LGBT community, having been a friend of Scouts and um, having elected Scout, I think, twice to serve as the president of the Pride Alliance. Uh, just goes to show what warm feelings there were for Scout. And um, I'm sure those warm feelings persist. I thought I wanted to give um, you know, whatever I could to help. And, and it's not much, but one thing I, I thought I could provide is just a little bit of clarity about the legal questions. Um, you know, regardless of what you think about the topic, I think we can all agree that over the last two weeks uh, it's become national news and there have been lots of hot takes from every side. Um, so it was very unclear to me what the actual legal questions involved were. Uh, so this is just a fairly involved presentation on police use of force, but of course it's just a primer. Uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer and, and I'm making this video just so it comes out in a timely manner. I, I don't even feel that personally I, I was able to finish the research. Before we begin, I just wanted to say that there are a lot of resources on the Georgia Tech campus if you are a current student. Uh, and this is just a short list that I've taken from the Dean of Students. Um, so please feel free to reach out if you need help. I can personally vouch that from my friends who um, were having tough times, the Dean of Students themselves is, is really underrated. Um, everybody said, spoke very highly of the help they received from the Dean. Um, just a disclaimer, so this is for information only. We're talking about laws, but I don't want anybody to get the idea that this is sound legal advice. It's definitely just an overview of, of many cases that have come before the Supreme Court and other courts. I'm not a lawyer, I have no legal training, and uh, as you think about this, you probably want to apply it to the ongoing investigation, um, which is fine, but bear in mind that it, the investigation is ongoing and so many of the facts are not available. And this particular presentation is only about federal civil rights law, so this is civil law, so that means the, the question is, is somebody liable for monetary damages? It's not uh, criminal law it's, and it has no bearing on state laws as well. And this was only about 25 hours of research, so by Georgia Tech standards this presentation would get like a D. So signposting, uh, we're going to review the actual event just to give people context if they're not aware, but I'm just going to do that verbally. There are no videos or, or audio from the actual event in this presentation. I'm um, going to do an introduction to U.S. law and then go into some of the relevant law uh, on foundations of use of, fort in our, use of force in our court system and some common questions that I pulled mostly from Reddit. Um, you know, at this point, I, I'm going to cut it and that'll be this video and then, you know, if we have some, some more questions or people are interested in hearing specifically about the cases which are most factually similar to, to what happened in Georgia Tech, uh, we can make that into a second video. So the facts so far, uh, Scout called 911 uh, Saturday at 11.17 p.m. Uh, two weeks ago and reported themselves as a suspicious armed person. I think exactly what they said was that um, there was someone who was drunk and had a knife and might have a gun and they were just walking around a certain part of campus. Um, so it seems from the videos of the event that there are at least five police officers um, responding to the, the video and the officers command Scout to drop the knife to stop moving and uh, Scout advances haltingly first towards one officer and then towards another group of officers, one of whom uh, eventually shoots Scout uh, fatally. Um, and then at some time later, three suicide notes are found in Scout's room. If there was no, no question of um, that it was a suicide based on the fact that Scout was yelling, shoot me, I think that that settled the question. Um, so that's what we know so far, and I'm not really going to refer to this uh, too much during the video, but every now and then um, we might talk about the most relevant parts. So let's look into law. This is from a very high level. Um, so there's three types of law. There's statutory law. Um, which is like legislative law, so, there's, so some body meets to create a new law. This is probably what you think of when you think of a law. Um, so, you know, Congress making a law, or your, your local um, state bodies of government. The next one is regulatory law, so this is kind of with the executive branch, so this would be something like the Food and Drug Administration, 
Um, they're given some kind of power from some piece of legislation, but generally all the details of what they do are not captured in that legislation, but they establish some regulatory law themselves. Um, this also happens to coincide with all the things that you might have heard, you know, questions of presidents giving executive orders regarding. Um, so, you know, Homeland Security, immigration, all these things, regulatory law often applies. And then lastly, common law. So this is the most unfamiliar part of law, I think, to, to most Americans. Um, so we work on a system of precedence. That means when one case is decided, um, we try to apply the type of uh, decision making that was used in that case to future cases. So this is called stare decisis, um, and that's to follow the precedent when possible. And that's how we build up this, this common law, this, this whole um, kind of collection of cases which we can then uh, use to make sure that we are applying things evenly across the judicial system so that if you do something that's factually similar in one place, you get a similar result to a person who did a factually similar thing in a different case. Um, and then whenever we have something that's completely new, maybe we, we just don't know how to deal with it yet, that's a matter of first impression. So, um, you know, in most cases now, the country being hundreds of years old, uh, can be seen in the framework of existing laws, but every now and then you get something that's just completely new. Um, when we're applying these decisions, it's important to understand which courts actually have authority over which other courts. So there are three layers of hierarchy. Um, there's the Supreme Court, and that has power over all the courts of appeals. And those decisions of the courts of appeals have uh, authority over any of the district courts that are within them. So starting from the bottom and going up, uh, you know, this particular event happened in Fulton County. So that would fall into the uh, Georgia Middle District Court and that court would be the trial court. So this court has the kind of what you think of when you think of a court. You know, there's a judge, there might be a jury, um, and they're trying to establish the facts of the case, and then they're trying to apply the law to those facts. And if there's any kind of um, question of whether the law was applied correctly or whether the facts were found correctly, um, it might be appealed. And if it is appealed, then it would go to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And then if there's even further um, clarification needed, uh, the Supreme Court might choose to weigh in as well. Um, and so when we look at that hierarchy, um, it's actually only the 11th Circuit Court and the Supreme Court whose decisions are binding for uh, the Georgia Middle District Court. Uh, so while we can look at the other ones, they just have persuasive authority. And persuasive authority might sound, you know, reasonable, like, oh, okay, you know, this is something we'll, we'll, we'll take into consideration and assume that it, it really is um, something that can predict the outcome of a case. Uh, but as I was researching, I found out that persuasive authority is, is really maybe a misnomer because in the cases I found, even if something really factually similar happened in a different district court, let's say instead of in the 11th uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, it was in you know the 7th Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, they'd be very unlikely to actually reference it at all, even if it was very factually similar. And the reason is, if there's some existing law on a topic within your kind of chain of hierarchy, um, that kind of trumps anything else. So it's really that there's like mandatory authority, and instead of calling it persuasive authority, it would be like, well, this is the best you have authority. If you, if you really have nothing to go on, you can at least try to use that. But I don't know, it seemed kind of, um, don't take it too seriously, was my impression. Especially not on these cases where um, there's plenty of, of use of force uh, court cases already in existence in every circuit court. So let's talk about your constitutional rights. You know, Why do you even have a case to bring that there's such a thing as excessive use of force? Um, the major one is the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizures it goes on from there. So if you're arrested uh, with the use of force, that's somebody seizing your, your, your body, your person. Um, and if deadly f use of force is used, that's of course um, you know, kind of the most serious uh, seizure possible. The next most common uh, right that is often um, litigated in use of force cases is the 14th Amendment's due process clause. So no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This one is considerably harder to prove, I think, than the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment has this word unreasonable. It's easier to show that something's unreasonable, whereas the Fourteenth Amendment, through various court interpretations, has come to have a higher standard. 
Uh, I think that the phrase, if I recall, is shocks the conscience. It has to really be an egregious uh, error, and not just uh, something that's unreasonable. Um, so what do you do? Let's say some government official denied you those rights. Um, do you have any recourse? So for a long time in American history, the answer might have been not really, or it wasn't well defined. Um, but in the Reconstruction Era South, when the 14th Amendment was being introduced, as well as the 13th and 15th Amendments, so 13th abolishing slavery, 14th of the Due Process Clause that the states had to abide by uh, the Bill of Rights and, and basically had all the same requirements that the federal government did, um, as, as well as other things. It talks about citizens, citizenship in the 14th Amendment. And then the 15th Amendment is that um, you can't deny someone the right to vote based on their race or their prior servitude. Um, and in the Reconstruction South, um, you know, there were often some local governments who would defy those orders. Um, the Ku Klux Klan was in prominence at that time, and uh, it was felt that there was some mechanism that was missing. There needed to be some way for people to sue when there were these kinds of abuses um, that deprived people of civil rights. Uh, so that the solution to this was um, U.S. Code Section 1983. Uh, this was written in 1870s. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact year, um, but it didn't come into wide use until you know almost 100 years later. And what it states is every person who, under color of any statute, so that means anybody who's acting with the authority of the government in some way. Um, of any state subjects any citizen of the United States to the deprivation of any rights secured by the Constitution and laws shall be liable to the party injured. Um, so this states pretty clearly that somebody might owe you money if they deprive you of your civil rights and they were acting as a, as a government official in some way. Um, but of course, you know, this is a joking question, but can I use that law to sue the police for giving me parking tickets? I mean, you know, in some sense it's a seizure, you know, especially if they impound your car or something. Um, and yet, clearly, that's something that the police need to be able to do. So if we just let anybody bring a suit, we would have a court system jammed up with police officers going and defending that they needed to, to give you know, parking tickets or this sort of thing. And all these frivolous lawsuits would become a real burden. Uh, so what we have instead um, are some court cases that actually limit when you can use Section 1983 for uh, suing public officials um, or in, in government employees, not just public officials. Uh, so the first one is Harlow versus Fitzgerald in, in 1981. Um, this is a US Supreme Court case, so it, case, so it has mandatory authority. Um, and the important thing here is that it established some principles that are very relevant to use of force law. The actual content of this case, I believe, was that um, Fitzgerald was a contractor and he was a whistleblower. He showed that a certain government project was, I think, billions of dollars uh, overspending. And Nixon was very angry, and I believe he said something like, let's get that son of a bitch out of here. Um, and he directed his, his staff to uh, cut off this contract. Uh, so Fitzgerald sued Nixon and uh, the other staff members. So they threw out the suit of Nixon versus Fitzgerald because the president has absolute immunity from civil cases, so uh, he can't owe any damages uh, based on a civil case. I mean, it's possible that the president could still be um, found guilty of a, of a criminal act. Uh, but the employees who actually, you know, carried out the, the uh, firing or the, the cutting off of the contract of Fitzgerald, um, it wasn't as clear. So the Supreme Court clarified that there's this concept of qualified immunity, which protects government officials from liability uh, for civil damages, but there, there is a catch. It doesn't completely protect them insofar as their conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which a reasonable person would have known. Um, so this is still kind of vague, but there's this idea that there's this reasonable person who you could, you could imagine uh, and then you could figure out in some objective way whether something was reasonable. And this was a step forward because while that's still not super clear, we're going to look at more cases which make it more clear. Um, it's certainly more clear than what used to exist, which was before this time you had to show that there was some subjective mental state, like that this employee had committed this action um, with some kind of malice and, and intention to harm. And it's very hard to get inside of people's heads, so that was not a very useful criteria.
Um, and then lastly, something that's important, a piece of terminology, a summary judgment. So in all these use of force cases, you'll see that uh, in general, the police officer asks uh, that there be a summary judgment. And this is basically saying that I want a ruling without going to a full trial because regardless of what the facts are, um, you know, even if you, you put all of the facts in the light which is most um, helpful to the plaintiff, I am not liable, and so there's no point even having a trial. I have qualified immunity, so you can just have a summary judgment and it'll be done right there before it started. So let's clarify the qualified immunity a little bit more. Um, there was another Supreme Court case, Malley versus Briggs, and I'm not gonna get into the details of this one, but I just thought the quote was uh, maybe a nice summary. Uh, as a matter of public policy, qualified immunity provides ample protection to all, but the plainly incompetent or those who knowingly violate the law. Um, so it's giving the, the case that, you know, as a societal cost, we, we need to have this as a matter of public policy. And it might mean that some police officers or other government officials make mistakes um, and they get away with it. But, you know, the alternative is, is that the entire system breaks down from frivolous lawsuits. Um, there are a few more uh, clarifications of qualified immunity, Saucier versus Katz and Pearson versus Callahan. Um, so uh, the first one, Saucier vs. Katz, it was a, an animal rights activist who was arrested. The second one, Pearson vs. Callahan, um, it was a narcotics uh, bust that was done without a search warrant, and the person who was busted uh, claimed that it violated their constitutional rights. Um, and in both of them, you know, the details of the cases aren't so important, but the Supreme Court also gave guidance about how qualified immunity should be applied. And they broke it down into two pieces. First, there's a question of, was the action unconstitutional? So you have to actually decide, given the, the current legal state of the matter, is it unconstitutional or not? And then secondly, is it clearly established that the action is unconstitutional? Um, so you know, it could be the case that a government official gets qualified immunity just because it's not really clear whether uh, what they did was wrong or right at the time. Uh, one last uh, Supreme Court case on the subject, McCullough versus Antolini, 2009. Uh, United States Court of Appeals, 11th Circuit. So this happens to be from a Court of Appeals that would have jurisdiction over any case that was heard in the Georgia Middle District Court. Um, and it describes how to review requests for summary judgment. And this is actually not the first time this is described, but I just found that this quote was particularly good. Um, so in conducting review of the District Court's resolution of a summary judgment motion based on qualified immunity, we resolve all issues of material fact in favor, in favor of the plaintiff. And it goes on from there. But basically it's saying that the way that you uh, do a qualified immunity assessment is that, uh, in the case that somebody asks for summary judgment, is that anything that's, that's agreed upon, you assume that that's fact. And then anything that's disputed, you assume that whatever would be most helpful to the plaintiff is true. And so in that case, Hypothetically, even then, if the plaintiff would lose, there's no point having a trial. That the the police officer would be protected by qualified immunity, and you can you can give the summary judgment. Otherwise, you have to go to trial and actually figure out what's true and what's not true. So let's get into use of force common law. When can police use deadly force? Let's look at Tennessee versus Garner. This is a U.S. Supreme Court case, so it has mandatory authority. And just to give uh, some background. Uh, what actually happened in this case was a police officer was responding to a burglary call and as he arrived he saw the suspect running and, and chased him to a fence. Uh, the suspect, Mr. Garner, began climbing the fence and the police officer could clearly see that uh, Garner was not armed and was clearly trying to escape and uh, decided to fire their, their uh, service weapon uh, to stop the, the person from escaping. And in this case, um, it was found to be unconstitutional. And the reason was, as quoted here, the use of deadly force is unconstitutional where the officer, excuse me, the use of deadly force is constitutional only where the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat of death or serious physical injury to the officer or others. Um, so that's really the most relevant part in general, but it also uh, clearly states that you can't shoot someone who's fleeing unless they just committed a very uh, violent crime or you're afraid that they're about to. Uh, moving on to our next case, Graham versus Connor. So um, another United States Supreme Court case just a few years later. And in this case, what was happening was uh, Mr. Graham 
was with a friend in their car and he was having a diabetic um, incident. Uh, his blood sugar was too low and he needed to get some sugar. So he asked his friend to quickly go to the convenience store on the corner. He ran in to get some orange juice. He noticed there was a really long line. He ran out to his friend who had been waiting in the car, just idling, jumps back in the car and they peel off to go to the next store. Uh, and meanwhile, from across the street, uh, a police officer, Officer Connor, saw all this happening and thought it was very suspicious. The guy runs into a store, he's there for a very short amount of time, runs back out into a waiting getaway vehicle, perhaps. Uh, so he thought it might be a robbery and he, he uh, went, pulled them over shortly afterwards and in the process of being pulled over, um, Mr. Graham ended up passing out from his diabetic incident. He also was roughed up a little bit. I think uh, his foot was broken or injured and he had brought a civil rights claim consequently. Um, but the court um, returned that this was constitutional because in use of force cases related to the Fourth Amendment, the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than with 2020 vision of hindsight. So they're basically saying, yeah, this guy wasn't actually committing a robbery, but you know, a reasonable officer could think that. Um, the estate of Larson, its ex-relative, uh, Sturdivian versus Murr, I don't know how you say that, um, but this is something that has persuasive authority, so I wouldn't put too much stake in this for this particular case. Uh, I just wanted to talk about it because it gives um, a very good set of bullet points that we can go over quickly. Just to give some context for this case, um, Larson called 911 threatening to kill himself or someone else and two officers responded. Um, Larson had a knife and he was asked to exit the building and drop the knife. Uh, he came out on the porch with the knife and continued to advance on the officers until he was a distance of 7 to 12 feet away, at which point he bent down as if to place the knife on the ground, but he stood back up with the knife um, and took one more step forward and the officers opened fire and fatally shot uh, him. And this case kind of laid out a, a bunch of, of criteria that might be analyzed when you're looking at a use of force case. So in assessing the degree of threat facing officers, we consider one, whether the officer ordered the suspect to drop his weapon and the suspect's compliance with the police commands. Two, whether any hostile motions were made with the weapon towards the officers. Three, the distance separating the officers and the suspect. And four, the manifest intentions of the suspect. Um, so this gives uh, a few things that can be considered, but this isn't an exhaustive list, um, but definitely something that would be useful in, in analyzing um, future cases. So now we're going to go to some questions from Reddit regarding police use of force on uh, Scout Schultz. And these are obviously more particular to, the, to, to Scout Schultz and, and not just police use of force in general. Um, but being very specific means that often it's not possible to get an actual decision from a Supreme Court case where they're, they're giving some rule that, that should be followed. Um, so I would really take all this with a grain of salt. It's almost all uh, not mandatory, and even in the cases where it is mandatory, it's usually like a very minor part of the case, which wouldn't be considered you know, the, the main um, legal question that was being answered in that case. Um, but do police have a duty to retreat? So there was a um, Supreme Court case, Reed, versus, uh, Reed v. Hoy, in 1990. Um, so an officer was responding to a domestic abuse uh, call, and when they arrived at the residence, the man was outside and uh, threatened the officer with, a, I think, a bamboo stake. And uh, when the officer wouldn't leave, uh, the man went to his lawn and got a wood-splitting mall and then began approaching the officer who shot him in the chest. And in this case, the officer never attempted to leave and it was found that police officers have no duty to retreat before defending themselves using deadly force, which makes sense or else you could just intimidate the police into leaving at any time. But this case actually isn't very important because uh, it happened in Oregon where there was a law requiring civilians to retreat if possible. In Georgia, they don't even have that law. There's a standard ground law, so even a civilian could just stand in one place if they were facing a, a threat and respond with deadly force. Um, but, you know, it might be interesting to see that the Supreme Court has said that that's constitutional. You don't have to worry that that Georgia law might be unconstitutional. Correction, the Ninth Court of Appeals said that. Uh, so it could possibly be unconstitutional if the Supreme Court decided otherwise. Do police have an incentive to retreat? 
So maybe they don't have a duty, but maybe it's good for some reason. Um, so I found one case where it did seem to be um, true that this was good. There's Plakas v. V. Drinsky. Uh, this was the United States Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit. So again, only persuasive authority because Georgia would fall into the Eleventh Circuit. Um, and in this case, uh, there was a uh, person who was assaulting a police officer with a fire poker, fireplace poker. And at various points um, during the interaction, the police officer tried to retreat. And uh, I believe they either tripped or, or felt that they bumped into a tree and, and were no longer able to retreat. And at that point, they deployed deadly force um, shooting the, the person. And it was found that, among other things, uh, it was in the favor that this was probably constitutional because they attempted to retreat. And only once they couldn't, they used deadly force. Um, so definitely, you know, looked good for the police officer that this was probably constitutional because they had retreated, even though they didn't have to. Uh, so the question of can a city or an institute that employs a police force be held liable for a failure to train? Um, well, the, ans the short answer is yes, there are specific laws um, that deal with that. Uh, but the longer answer is it's pretty hard. And just to look at a few of the requirements, so once again, this is persuasive authority, but this is kind of an interpretation of something that would be mandatory authority. Uh, so there are Supreme Court cases on the same subject, but I'm just doing this one because, you know, again, it has a set of bullet points that are easy to apply. So uh, you can't just say that somebody should have been trained better or they could have been trained better, but you have to actually show a couple of things. Uh, one, that the police action actually violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights. Uh, second, that the injury arose under circumstances which constitute an unusual, uh, excuse me, a usual and recurring situation with which police officers must deal. Uh, and then three, that there is a direct causal link between the alleged constitutional deprivation and the inadequate training. And four, that the city failure to train de demonstrates deliberate indifference to the constitutional rights of citizens. Um, so looking back over these, uh, the second one, that the injury arose under circumstances which are usual and recurring. Uh, it might be hard to decide whether the, the case of um, scout is usual or recurring. Um, it's certainly more common that Georgia Tech police officers deal with someone who's suicidal or uh, is attempting suicide and that they have to resort to firing. I believe on Reddit uh, a few months ago, the GTPD uh, stated that they have never fired or been fired upon. Uh, so this is likely the only exception unless there was another case in the last few months. Um, so they've only fired once, but they've dealt with suicidal students. Given the, the rate of um, student suicides among uh, college-aged uh, people, I think it's 7.5 out of 100,000. Georgia Tech has uh, roughly 25,000 students, so it might be like two a year um, that people actually commit suicide and probably more that are attempted. Uh, I don't know if you could call that usual and recurring, though, because in this particular case, having somebody who has a knife and is suicidal is uh, perhaps the, the first time that it's happened at Georgia Tech. I, I have no way of knowing. The last thing I want to note here is that deliberate indifference is a term that has uh, a definition, and it is pretty um, difficult to say that somebody was deliberately indifferent. Uh, it means more than simple or even heightened negligence. It requires an act or omission purposefully committed by a person who must have realized that the conduct was unnecessarily dangerous or which conduct was done heedlessly or recklessly without regard to the consequences, or without regard to the rights and safety of others. Um, but of course, this could be a whole slideshow by itself, so let's move on. Uh, do a police department, does a police department, there's a typo, have a duty to deploy less deadly weapons, so less than lethal weapons. The state of Smith versus Silva, so in 2006, uh, this is another case with persuasive authority. So what was happening here was officers were called to a family disturbance in a home. They were in a hallway when one of the people involved in the disturbance came out of their room, that was Mr. Smith. Uh, he had a box cutter that had a three inch blade and uh, it's disputed how far away he was from the officers, but in the end they did end up uh, shooting and killing Mr. Smith and uh, the estate of Mr. Smith sued uh, alleging, among other things, that the city failed to deploy less than lethal weapons, uh, which indicated deliberate indifference. Uh, but, but as this quote states, is it is not enough for the estate to simply point out to something that the city could have done. Uh, so it's not deliberate indifference to just say, "Well, you could have done better." You have to show somehow that uh, you can you can prove that these people were indifferent. Um, 
which seems difficult. I don't know if there's any kind of discovery process in this sort of uh, case, but you know, you probably need a very um, damaging kind of smoking gun piece of evidence that points that they knew that it was bad and they didn't care. Do police have an incentive to deploy less deadly weapons? So maybe they don't have to, but um, you know, is there reason they might? Uh, in city of city and county of San Francisco versus Sheehan, um, this is a Supreme Court case. Uh, they granted summary judgment to the officer in this case because uh, Reynolds used deadly force only after she found that pepper, pepper spray was not enough force to contain the situation, among many other things. So this doesn't say in general uh, you can do you can use deadly force after you pepper spray someone, but. Definitely in this case, it pointed towards the fact that probably um, what the officer was doing was, was more likely to be constitutional. This question, is it threatening someone to approach them with a the knife despite commands to stop and drop the knife? So it's clearly threatening to say I'm going to kill you or something to that effect. Um, but as we learned from uh, Larson, a case that was in the beginning of, of the use of force uh, presentation, it is important to know what the mental state of the person is. So what are their intentions? Are they just trying to self-harm or are they trying to harm somebody else? So to know whether it means to be threatening just to walk towards someone is a big deal because if you're just trying to harm yourself, that makes it probably more likely to be unconstitutional um, to use deadly force against such a person. But if they're trying to harm other people, that, that definitely changes the equation a lot. So in this case, Adam Carter, um, who is being represented by his uh, relatives who have the last name Connor, just to explain the title. Um, Adam Carter was suicidal and I believe also intoxicated. He was speaking to his uncle and said he would be willing to speak to a doctor. Um, the uncle called the local psychiatric hospital and they didn't answer, so he called the police and asked if they could help pick up his son and, and bring him to the hospital. Um, by the time the police had arrived, uh, Mr. Carter had cut his wrist with a paring knife, the paring knife being a rather small kitchen knife, probably the smallest kitchen knife um, you'd see a few inches in length usually. Um, and when the police arrived, uh, Mr. Carter was exiting the building uh, with them and they noticed as he was exiting the foyer that he still had the knife in his hand. Um, the officer commanded him to drop the knife. He didn't drop the knife. He took a few more steps into the foyer, at which point they opened fire, killing him. Uh, it's not clear to me how far apart the, um, the distance is in the foyer. Um, they only reference being on the steps versus being near the door without explaining what that means in the decision. Um, in any case, the relevant part to answer a question of um, is it threatening someone to just walk at them with a knife is that while Carter stubbornly maintained possession of his knife, the assumed circumstances Thompson confronted do not establish that Carter, Carter threatened anyone with it. So I want to point out the word assumed in that first quote. This is when they're doing the part of the analysis where they're trying to decide if there should be a summary judgment or not. So to reiterate from what we had earlier in this presentation, when they're analyzing that, they say, OK, everything that was agreed upon, we're going to assume that's true. Everything that's disagreed upon, we're going to assume that it's whatever the plaintiff said, whatever looks best for the plaintiff. And then we'll see if there's any legal um, standing for, for the officer to actually be able to be liable. So in the situation, this first quote, it says, assuming that you know, everything the plaintiff said was true, so that like, you know, this guy um, made two assertions, uh, we have held that holding a weapon in a non-threatening position while making no sudden moves fails to support the proposition that a reasonable officer would have had probable cause to feel threatened. Uh, so in this particular case, um, these officers were not given qualified immunity, they were not given a summary judgment, uh, and so I think we can answer our question. Uh, it's not always threatening someone, at least in this case it wasn't considered threatening someone to approach them with a knife. Does the size of the knife matter? I've heard a lot about it's a multi-tool, it has a small blade, um, but to answer the question more generally, um, does the size of the knife matter? It may matter, but other facts are usually more important. So. Uh, if they mention the size of the knife, it's usually in passing or it's in a list among many, many other concerns. Uh, one place where they mentioned a particularly large knife was in Larson. Um, so this was the case where the man was um, exiting his house and was on the porch and then seemed to put down the knife but didn't really and the police shot him when he took one more step. Uh, so in that case, um, 
you know, in a list of many things, the fifth thing uh, that, that supported that it was a constitutional use of force was that the knife was very large, had a blade that was over a foot in length. But there are many other cases where small knives um, were also considered threats at a close proximity. So we just talked about Connor versus Thompson. This was a, a paring knife um, that Mr. Carter had cut his wrist with. And then uh, just before that, we talked about the estate of Smith versus Silvas. That was a three inch box cutter. So uh, certainly in many cases, um, the fact that the knife is small does not affect the outcome as much as some of the other aspects of the, the situation. Uh, but people are interested. I've heard a lot of discussion about, in particular, the state law about carrying weapons on school property, uh, where it defines a weapon to be any other knife having a blade of two or more inches. Uh, so I did look at the pictures and could kind of identify a few different slots and pins, uh, proud elements like various screws and buttons that were on the knife. And upon searching Amazon for multi-tool, it's actually one of the first results and one of the cheapest results. Uh, so we can measure the blade. Uh, today. So this is the package that I received from Amazon. I ordered one of the knockoff uh, versions. The original one is $40 and there are many, many knockoffs which are less. This one's under the brand name Cerber Russo. This one happens to be black, I guess. A lot of the other ones are gray, or at least more gray than this. Okay, it's a multi-tool. Here is the knife. It does lock. So let's uh, measure this knife now. Of course, this might not be exactly the same knife that was in use um, by Scout, but this is as close as we could get just buying a similar knife off Amazon. It's about 2.36 inches, measured from the tip to where the handle begins. So that is longer than the Georgia state law mandate of two inches or less. So this would be considered a weapon. Uh, but I would like to stress, uh, regardless of the result of, you know, if the blade is two inches longer or not, it doesn't really have much effect on whether the shooting was justified. Um, because the reasonableness of it has to do a lot more with the circumstances. And part of the test is that you can't use 20-20 vision. It would be beyond 20-20 vision to know what size the blade is. Uh, clearly, the officers just know that there's a knife, and the presence of the knife is, is what really affects the case, not whether it is or isn't more than two inches long. Uh, but you might say, at least they could tell, even in, in, a, in a moment's notice, um, does it matter if a knife is closed or sheathed? In this case, it was a multi-tool, and presumably it was closed because it was found closed, or uh, at least mostly closed without the blade extended um, when Scout fell to the ground. Uh, so there's one case I found that involved a, a sheathed knife, or, well, closed knife. In this case, it was a, a knife that could be flipped out with one hand, a three-inch blade. Um, <clears throat> but the direct uh, reasoning from this case is what matters is if a reasonable officer would believe the decedent, the person who was deceased, that's a term that comes up a lot in deadly use of force cases, the decedent had a knife in the given situation and to, to directly quote the case, that's my uh, paraphrasing, but I think I have a direct quote here in my notes. But even assuming both of the plaintiff's conclusions about the knife, that Reddy did not possess it and that it was always closed, are true, they do not affect the result in this case. Reddy's actual possession of the knife is not relevant based on the facts as they existed in Reddy's apartment to determining whether Deputy Clepado used a constitutionally reasonable amount of force. That is because a reasonable officer in Deputy Claplado's position would believe that Reddy had a knife because Mr. Sharp shouted that he did, and he would have no ability to verify the fact before being faced with a rapidly developing situation. Uh, so in this particular case, the distances were very um, close. They were all within one room within, I think, a uh, single digit number of feet. And um, you know the decedent, decedent had just recently entered that room. Um, I don't know uh, if the case for Scout would be different because it seemed that the encounter lasted um, you know, at least about a minute on film and, and I've asked the person who, who filmed that how long it was going on beforehand. They said they'd been doing homework for about a minute before they started filming. So you can assume there's two minutes of, of time that the police have interacted with Scout um, where the blade uh, seemed to be 
in the right hand at all times uh, and not any sudden movement. Uh, but really, it's hard to say. There isn't enough precedent on this issue to come to a clear answer. Just to review, we went over the facts of use of force against Scout Schultz. We did an introduction of US law, and then we uh, went through some foundational use of force Supreme Court cases. We followed that with trying to answer some common questions, or answer is a strong word, look at cases which may or may not be applicable because they were mostly um, just persuasive authority. Uh, I intended to get a little bit further in my, in my research and actually look for all the cases that were factually most similar to uh, the case at hand and then to analyze them alongside footage of the event. Um, I don't know if that's really called for. I'm sure that many people don't really want to watch that footage again. Um, but if you would have an interest in that, let me know in the comments. Um, also, let me know if you have any questions. I know there were some questions I didn't have time to answer. For example, um, what is the 21-foot rule with regards to knife-wielding subjects? When does it apply? Is it actually a legal defense to, to say anyone with a knife within 21 feet um, is a threat of serious harm to a police officer? Uh, so yeah, please let me know if you would like to see that question answered or any others. Thank you if you've taken the last 40 minutes to listen to all of these cases and try to come to an informed understanding of, of the things that may be in play, even if it is too early to, to know how the case would end up just due to the fact that we don't have all the facts. Um, this is something that you know our greatest thinkers at our highest levels of the judicial system have thought a lot about. Clearly, this is a very complicated issue, and we could talk about the finer legal points for a long time. Um, but I just wanted to say how proud I am to be a Yellow Jacket, seeing the response from some of the members of the community to get better mental health resources on campus, to support the LGBT community. They've lost not just a friend, but a leader. Um, it's just been tremendous to see the outpouring and, and to see the continued outpouring even now, uh, two weeks later. And I'd like to thank everybody for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. If you'd like to know more, I'd encourage anyone to Google the cases or the laws that I talked about. And if you're a current Georgia Tech student, you can use the library to access certain databases, including Westlaw, which can provide you a summary of any of the cases we talked about, as well as many tools to make it easier to search for more information.